Hey y'all, welcome to lecture number four. Uh, this is uh, Remix Music, Art, and Culture for the week starting uh, June 9th. Um, task for this week, I uh, have a set of readings for you. Uh, you have your post due on Friday as usual, your discussion questions due on Sunday, and your second project this week. I uh, also can give a uh, lecture on dub and regressive ideology of Remix. So again, the assignments um, by Friday at 10 p.m. Uh, you're going to have your post due. Uh, and so please see the prompt in the week three, uh, I'm sorry, the week four folder. Uh, Sunday by 10 p.m., uh, you'll have your project, the breakdown project. Uh, again, there's a prompt in the week four folder for that as well. Uh, and then also your, your weekly discussion uh, comments are due as well. So the reading this week, uh, going back to the Eduardo Navas remix theory, uh, I'd like you to return to the section called The Regressive Ideology of Remix in Chapter 1, and then also read Chapter 2, which is about uh, the history of dub. Uh, I'd also like you to look at these uh, essays on cultural appropriation. Uh, I'll talk about them in a minute. Uh, technically, for the assignments of this week, you only really need to read one, but they're pretty short, so uh, maybe you'll uh, look through a collection of them. Uh, the recommended are also highly recommended. Uh, if you have time, you should look through those too. Again, they're, they're short, uh, so it shouldn't take too much time. The post this week uh, asks you to discuss cultural appropriation in the context of remix. And so this week, Novice is going to chart the precarious land remix walks between progressive and regressive. Uh, and so uh, one of those aspects that's, that's getting a lot of media attention lately is cultural appropriation. Uh, and so you see I've, I've selected a bunch of articles uh, that are about cultural appropriation in contemporary uh, pop music. Uh, so there's one on Myers Cyrus, one on uh, Macklemore, a couple on Harlem Shake, uh, one on Katy Perry. If you post this week, I'm asking you to pick one of these articles, uh, or you can pick one of your own if you've found one that, that you like better, or there's a particular object you want to talk about instead, uh, just let me know. Uh, but all you have to do is pick one of the articles uh, from the list, uh, and then write about it in your post in terms of novice's discussion remix. Okay, so you're going to pick uh, one of these or one of your own. Uh, read it well. Uh, read it in uh, with uh, the remix theory in mind or the regressive ideology of remix in mind. And then your post this week is to talk about it, your article, respond to your article, or to uh, the subject of the article, Miley Cyrus or Macklemore or whatever, in the, in the context of what is being discussed in Navas's piece. So the other major thing you're doing this week is the breakdown project. So the last uh, project you did was the collage project, and for the collage project, you picked all of your own uh, media objects and put them together, and then wrote a reflection on them. Uh, this time, you're going to pick a remix that somebody else made, uh, an established author, musician, artist, and uh, do the same kind of work. So first you need to find a remix you find particularly interesting given our discussions. It can be anything you want, uh, anything you think is, you know, easily definable as remix. Uh, you don't want to pick some something that's going to be controversial or too difficult. Pick something that's obviously a remix that's easy for you to work with. Uh, then identify two or more sampled sources in a work, and then discuss the effect of the interaction of these two sources in the same place. Like, for example, if I were going to do Kanye West's uh, video for stronger, uh, you might talk about the relationship between uh, the Daft Punk sample that he's using and uh, the visual imagery that he's, taking, that he's riffing on from uh, the, the anime Akira. Uh, so as you're doing this, uh, I also want you to keep in mind uh, that Nawas reminds us that Remix is often occupying a complex uh, position between progressive and regressive, so hopefully that kind of comes out in your discussion of what happens when you put these these different sources together. But really it's up to you how you want to break down the relationship between the pieces. The idea is to uh, start doing this kind of cultural work on an external object. All right, so the regressive ideology of remix. Uh, so <clears throat> it boils down to, uh, in this section, the danger of subverting history. It says in the 1990s uh, and through the 2000s and you know, obviously on to today, uh, remix became a just a, a general form of consumption that was the inextricable and undeniable default form of consumption available to average listeners. 
So uh, you can think of the uh, iTunes version of culture, right? Or the Tumblr version, everything's reblogging. So he's concerned about, again, this, this uh, danger of subverting history, that you're able to remix this stuff, but it's decontextualizing it from any uh, historical reference or the place where it's coming from. Uh, he says the junk, younger generations may not know where the sample came from, may treat the remix material as original, uh, and then lose all of that cultural history. And if you remember last uh, week we were talking about, or it's not last week and the week before, we've been talking about how uh, removing the object from history was actually the positive thing. That's what allowed you to create a new meaning. Uh, but here it also has this flip side, the danger side, that you can remove it from history and then the history itself is lost. And then what you get is culture as this collection of free floating signifiers with no real connection to anything. Uh, they can all just be entered into a database of uh, cultural meanings to be rearranged and reorganized and uh, over and over again uh, without any connection to reality or the uh, lived experience of any real people. Uh, and this uh, is going to come up and be particularly important when you start looking into the topic of cultural appropriation for your posts. He gives the example of Rapper's Delight uh, as a uh, remix that loses the original or the reference to the original. It says, with the remix, even when used in a regressive fashion, uh, with a short history span, still demands people recognize some trace of history. And that's the, the uh, complicated and contradictory part of remix, right? So the, that it depends on, as we'll say down here a little bit, uh, the interest in sampling is uh, taking a bit of music the listener will recognize. So it's, it's trading on that ability, uh, the recognizability, the historical reference, uh, but then taking it out of the historical context that it was originally in. Uh, so again, it'll, it'll say here that it's, it ends up pointing only to itself. So at this point, sampling manifests itself as loops that can potentially go on forever. And so the sample that got picked up in Rapper's Delight, and then it keeps coming back in other forms, like for example here in the image from The Wedding Singer, uh, when they, the grandma gets up and does the, the Rapper's Delight. Uh, he uses Las Vegas as a as the most concrete example of this. So, uh, in Las Vegas, as a concrete example, image and sound are strategically repeated incessantly to create a seamless, spectacular loop. In a city with no clocks anywhere to be found, time is suspended. Day, night and day become one timeless loop, encouraging people to stay up as much as possible and spend all their time gambling at tables. Kitsch art. Again, this is art that art that isn't necessarily. Um, it is not high art, it just works on a reference or, or nostalgia value. Uh, so kitsch art ex exhibitions and collections are promoted as just another major spectacle on the strip. Nightly performances by cover bands, the Beatles, Elvis impersonators, naturally ju juxtaposed with uh, actual performers including Cher, Prince, and Wayne Newton, as if they belong in the same time period. Uh, so in Las Vegas, time stands still in the name of spectacle. So it's all of this sampling of culture, all decontextualized and moved into the different space in order to uh, basically eliminate history, eliminate time. It's all reference, it's all spectacle, it's all uh, supporting its, its uh, industrial ends. So then what does Dub have to do with all of this? Uh, in this section uh, we get the third, what, what Novice is going to call the third movement of uh, mechanical reproduction and sampling and that's the Dub movement. Uh, which is then going to begin the next set of movements into uh, the in different stages of remix, right? So he'll give us a history of dub, um, but he's not all that interested in where it first started or, he's, or who was the first one to do it. He says that's not necessarily what's important about dub. Instead, what's important about dub is its liminality. So he says here, dub as a musical concept vacillates among various definitions. The term itself exposes a conundrum upon which uh, Baba and Hart and Negri contest the margins of culture, and we'll talk about that in a minute. When we consider the history of Dublin, Jamaica, and other parts of the world, high and low, middle and center no longer exist. With clear divisions, yet they are still in play as ideological forces in popular culture. And so this is uh, where liminality is going to be helpful. So Dub, for him, is a threshold, so it's, it's not an issue for us in this instance. Which of these two pioneers first conceived the concept of dub. Like I said, he's not really interested in the details of the history. 
but that what developed as dub exposes a musical element that thrives on a threshold, what Homi Baba calls the liminal space where identity is constantly defined, where one is neither one nor the other, where one is both and neither, uh, where a third space to gain autonomy can take place. So dub exists in this middle ground between defined positions, and that's what's powerful and useful about it. And yet there's a problem with this position of always between or moving to stay between. Uh, and this is what Hart and Negri are going to argue. Hart and Negri are uh, critical theorists. Uh, Homi Baba, also a critical theorist. So the criticism of Hart and Negri is that both post-colonial and post-modern theories are looking at Western Enlightenment. Power has evacuated the bastion they are attacking and has circled around to their rear to join them in the assault in the name of difference. So in other words, this move to stay in between has be and this move to promote difference has become the strategy of power and capital as well. So he gets into the details of how this relates to dub in the section called dub in theory. Uh, and he, this is the quick sketch outline uh, to give you the main points of what's going on there. So uh, essentially power, colonialism, capital all work by defining and categori categorizing. The, the interrelation between those work through defining and categorizing. Uh, so Homi Baba says that to, to resist you need to avoid definition. Uh, you need to stay in the spaces in between. Uh, for this reason, difference becomes really important rather than just being different, because being different is a category. You need to be in a state of difference, because that's always enunciating self to something else. So if you're able to stay in this liminal space, uh, this space in between defined categories, uh, you're uh, going to be better off. You're going to be able to stay out of the system. You're going to be able to give yourself a, a, a name for yourself, an identity that isn't already defined within uh, the hegemonic structures. Hart and Negri critique the Homi Baba, and they say the difference is already built into and accommodated by empire. They're perfectly fine with you staying in the space in between, uh, and that liminal space is often a repressive or marginalized space. Uh, people who are forced into insta instable situations, forced to constantly move and redefine themselves, or have never had an, a, a established form of identity. And this is where you get uh, the discussion of Eric B. and Rakim uh, paid in full uh, that you get in uh, novice's description uh, where he makes the argument that bling culture or the the uh, success of bling culture is an expression of Hart and Avery's concepts so the rappers who have struggled monetarily in their upbringing often glorify their ability to make money in the composition in their composition and rhymes and find hip-hop music the form with which they take control of their production though not necessarily the reality in which they function they often do this while not understanding the contradictory social structure that enabled them to get there based on particular stereotypes that may uh, bring some economic stability to them as individuals, but the price of becoming labeled in a way that is comfortable to mainstream culture. And due to this reality, uh, Nava says, bling culture has no critical conscience. Uh, it is the fetishization of hip-hop culture. The lack of critical awareness, then, is part of a vicious cycle created by lack of education and positive role models and so on. But still, Navas doesn't want to throw out uh, Homi Baba's uh, emphasis, on, emphasis on and promotion of liminal spaces as, as strategically useful. Uh, and so he comes back to Baba uh, to, uh, for the argument that the threshold is a place where uh, production, uh, productive things can actually happen. One can actually do something productive within a space. And he says this is what happens for Dub. Uh, Dub manages to uh, succeed in both areas uh, to satisfy both uh, critics. It is both liminal and marginalized, and yet it's been highly influ influential on uh, popular music for well, what would be now four decades. Uh, at the same time, it's able to re it's, it has been able to remain responsive to repressed groups. Uh, artists control their own production. Uh, they're able to. They need very few resources. Uh, basically, just you know, records and things that are sitting around. Uh, and it can support an identity position that's worth celebrating. <clears throat> so again, what he finds so promising about uh, Dub and what's so interesting about Dub is that it's neither instrumental nor a version. It's in between complete abstraction and narration. Uh, so you have the, like the looping, and the looping music occasionally with these uh, the vocals that come in. Uh, the, the vocals introduce some narrative, a trace of allegory, but it's muffled and background into the bass. 
So in a sense, the history uh, of the reference is still there, even if it's not enunciated directly. Uh, dub is itself an established form, yet it's constantly shifting as new materials work out, they get new tech, and so on. And so it is able to be highly influential, ever moving, and yet remains marginal. And this is what he thinks is, is ultimately really uh, exciting about Dub and this careful line that it's able to walk uh, between uh, repressive and uh, progressive. So that's it for this week. Uh, please uh, post any questions as usual. Post any questions on uh, Google Plus. They're about the reading or about any of the uh, work that you have to do this week. Again, there's a prompt in the week four folder on Google Drive. Uh, this week, again, you have readings. Uh, you have your post, which is going to be ask you to look at one of the readings about cultural appropriation and talk about it in the context of novices' discussion here of uh, dub and regressive ideologies. Uh, and then you have your breakdown project. So again, if you have any questions, make sure you ask me, and I will see you all next week.